Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Julie Dugary. I'm a staff person at NOVA, and I'm also the co-chair of BCAT, the Bucks Coalition Against Trafficking. And I'm joined here uh, by Karen Kutzner, who is my co-chair, um, as well as other members of the BCAT Steering Committee. Um, they know who they are, and they can indicate their status um, in the chat box. Um, this is our first community meeting of 2021. Um, for folks that are new to BCAT, you should know that um, we were established in 2013 and we are a project of NOVA, the Network of Victim Assistance, which is the Comprehensive Crime Victim Service Agency for Bucks County. Um, our mission at BCAT is to eradicate human trafficking in Bucks County through victim identification, community education, enhancement of arrest and prosecution of traffickers, legislative advocacy, and a coordinated response of victim and survivor services. So we have many partners um, in the community who collaborate with us um, among our county government, um, folks from the state, people from our school districts, um, people from the faith-based community, and we are, we are really um, delighted to be able to offer this community presentation tonight. Um, you can learn more about BCAT uh, by going to our Facebook page and learn more about our committees and how you can join in to fight um, human trafficking in Bucks County. So we, we urge you to go there if you need more information. And there's also information at the NOVA website and uh, we can put that into the chat as well. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping things. We are recording this session. Um, so um, if people, we just want people to be aware of that. Um, we would like you to mute yourselves during the presentation. Um, and then to put your questions into the chat box. And when we get to the Q&A, we'll unmute folks and Karen Kutzner is gonna facilitate that part um, of the presentation. Um, if you are calling in by telephone and it's just showing your phone number, could you please ID yourself and, and send us your name so that we have that. Um, and I think that's all that I have in terms of housekeeping. I'm like double checking with Manny. Good on that? We did just want to let people know that there are uh, maybe members of the press who are part of our participants today um, who've been invited to participate. So we just wanted to let everyone know uh, we have some members of the press in the audience also. Great. Okay, I'm going to turn off the. Um, so, how did we get to this topic about how we talk about human trafficking and how we communicate? Um, Mandy and I were working um, in December on some materials for Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and uh, we came across an internally generated document um, from our own agency, and we looked at the graphic, and it was, uh, you know, it had a girl's hands being tied with ropes, and we said, wow, you know, this is not where we want to be in terms of the messaging that we're sending out. We, you know, we knew this, but um, thought that we really needed to take a deeper dive um, into how we talk about trafficking, how we talk about survivors, the people that are involved, and um, all of the aspects, including social media, including visuals. Um, what kind of message do we want to send? How do we want to engage with community partners um, and everyone in our community who cares about this issue and wants to make, um, make things better um, in helping survivors? So we happen to, I happen to have been in a webinar that Love 146 had run um, in, the, in the fall and knew of them and we took a look at their resources and we found out that yes, indeed, they have a director of communications and they had a lot of, uh, a lot of talking points and resources just on this very topic. So we were so glad to connect with Marilyn. Um, she is the communications director at 146 and she's been working there for the past decade. Um, she has a background in marketing and commercial design. She's particularly interested in trauma and healing and she seeks to use her designs, writing and photographs to handle the issue of child trafficking in a way that dignifies both the subject of her work as well as the audiences. Um, she graduated from Flagler College. When I go to college again, I'm gonna to go to that college because it's a, in a beautiful setting. Um, and she grew up in Florida um, on a swamp. So wonderful, interesting background. And she lives now in New England with her son, with her, with her husband, Tim and their son, Ansel. 
So I'm going to invite Marilyn to unmute and provide us with a wonderful presentation. Um, great. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm definitely honored to be gathered with a group of, um, yeah, such diverse practitioners and experts. Um, and so as um, Julie shared um, about my background, I've been at 1146 for over 12 years. Um, I live in New Haven, Connecticut, um, right in the midst of the Yale campus. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and you'll see on this slide, I, as she mentioned, I have a son. And I put this little icon on the slide to remind myself that uh, I can apologize in advance if my three-year-old that's running around outside the room interrupts me at any level or distracts me. Um, I am not, a it's worth mentioning what I, what I do, my background. She mentioned I'm a, design, I'm a designer in my background. I'm not a practitioner um, working with youth and clients. I'm not an academic. I have a lot of coworkers um, that are social workers and practitioners and public health experts. Um, but I'm a specialist in creating marketing and design communications. Um, and I've really enjoyed dedicating um, most of my career to thinking so far about specifically how to communicate child trafficking. And I was excited to work with one issue so that I could get to know that um, well and think about how to design and create you know, communications for it. Um, it's also worth mentioning that Love 146 focuses directly with child trafficking and in large part our work is focused on child sex trafficking. And so I hope that things I share are broadly applicable, but I'll give a caveat now that some of the thoughts here are going to be a little bit focused on that because that's where I've spent most of my time thinking about how to do this. Um, and so my insights are um, from working with coworkers, listening to their feedback about my communication, um, seeking input from people with lived experience about how our communication is, it, you know, goes for them. Um, and um, yeah, and just thinking through my own life experience about how I encounter our communications as somebody in the audience as well. Um, and most of what I've learned here, I can say I've learned by listening and making mistakes myself, the movement to end child trafficking, I see we all have a lot to learn. And so I think it's inevitable um, that some of us will learn by making mistakes. So if I share anything in the presentation that you see and think, ooh, maybe I should have done that differently. I I've done it wrong myself. And as Maya Angelou says, if, when you know better, do better. Um, and so I also want to say that I'm sure that many of you in the audience have much that I can learn from you. Um, so I may not be able to answer all of the questions. I still have questions about this very topic um, that I'm curious and exploring further. Um, and so, yeah, I look forward to sharing what I have learned, I think, and hearing from you all. Um, and so the things I want to touch on today um, is a common marketing tactic that I've sort of called the itch that I want to unpack. Um, how does it harm victims and how does it possibly harm the audience? Um, how does trauma-informed care relate to public awareness about child trafficking? And then just running through 10 tips um, that I could summarize about things I've picked up along the way about how to do this. Um, so I mentioned I went to school for graphic design and we were really being trained to work at, ad, at an ad agency. Um, and so we were designing and creating advertisements for a wide variety of things. Um, but a lot of it was approached as I observed through this mechanism of highlighting a pain point um, or making a pain point in someone's life and then telling them how to solve it. Um, and so, you know, if it's a boat, you might not have realized that you didn't like have adventure in your life and you weren't cool, you know, but now here's how you can, here's how you can solve it by this boat. Um, or a new phone, you didn't realize that this feature was something that you needed so much, or maybe it is highlighting a frustration that you already have with your current phone. And so we can resolve that by selling you a new phone. Um, and so that's what I've called the itch. You sort of give someone an itch and you tell someone how they can scratch it. Um, and so, but when you take that same approach and apply it to human rights issues um, and communicating about those things, um, often it looks like showing people some of the most horrific things that can make them very itchy, some of the most traumatic stuff, and then sometimes shaking them down for other action opportunities or general engagement, but often it's uh, for fundraising. Um, and so I think that comes at costs to both the subject um, and the victims and those we're communicating about, um, as well as the audience. Um, and um, 
yeah, I think that if there is, is such a thing as a means to an end, our responsibility is to ensure that supporters are helping, um, are a means to helping victims and not victims a means to engaging supporters. Um, and so I would, yeah, I like to pause when I'm making communication and think about the real goals um, and what our ultimate, you know, visions and missions are. And while the goal of the piece of communication you're making or the campaign might be to get attention for the problem, raise funds, get someone to visit a website or show up to an event, um, behind that is ultimately um, our various missions um, at, um, at Bucks, it's the, or BCAT, it's the um, eradicating trafficking in uh, Bucks County for Love 146, it's ending child trafficking and exploitation. And so if you look at those bottom lines, you don't wanna do anything in your communication that ultimately um, would undermine those bottom lines in some way. Um, and so, I mean, that's what's meant by nonprofit. Um, we're working towards those missions first. Um, and so the other thing, when I think about um, the audience that we're communicating with, something that I've come to realize is that our audience also is not it's not separate from um, people who've been victimized. Um, it's not um, us talking about somebody else. Um, yeah, there's that us and them thing of um, the people who we need to help and those of us who can help them um, being unrelatable is something that's often done in nonprofit communications, but I don't think is necessary. And I think there's benefits to breaking down that divide um, and because it's a reality. So the more I've learned from presenting about child trafficking and um, getting up and giving a talk in a public setting or um, sharing with a group of people. Um, maybe some of you have experienced this. Af often those who come up afterwards um, from the public and kind of share why this um, struck a chord with them or they engaged um, is something to do with their own adverse childhood experiences. Um, and I think a lot, I, I think that in the general audience, we can assume that you know a quarter to a third of women and honestly we're not sure to be how how prevalent victimization is in men because i don't think there's safety to disclose it or process that um but i'm assuming that you know a significant portion of my audience um have experienced that's just um sexual violence and trauma um but adverse childhood experiences and trauma throughout their lives in various forms um and if i think about those folks in my audience, I also don't want to do things that would be um, demeaning or triggering, um, yeah, to them. So, um, and even, I also want to consider too that the, vic the people that we're talking about, um, those impacted by child trafficking or trafficking at large, um, even though they not, may not actually be the primary audience of the flyer or the piece of communication you're making, um, they're, there are still, you know, we all know that they are, these are regular people of the community um, and we should assume they will encounter our, our communication. Um, it was a helpful piece of feedback once when one of our social workers was telling me about how one of the youth in our care had memorized the whole learn section of our website um, and just like knew the, you know, all the facts about child trafficking and they learned it from our website. So it brought to light for me, like the, um, while they may not be the number, the primary audience when I'm conceiving of a piece of communication, they're still ultimately the most important stakeholder. Um, and so we're used to thinking about, I've heard, I've heard the, um, about trauma-informed care, and I've heard it mostly described or applied in victim services, um, indirectly working with victims, um, and then to some extent with um, staff or employ in employment settings and thinking about vicarious trauma and how it impacts us as um, professionals. Um, I've not as often heard about trauma-informed care being applied um, to a mass marketing space or in broader public communications. Um, and there's lots of different ways of talking about trauma-informed care, um, and I'm not an expert on it. Um, but these five principles um, have been put forth by a group at the University of Buffalo and they've been a helpful guidance for me to think about in terms of how could I apply these principles to mass marketing and public communications. Um, and so, um, yeah, in terms of safety, thinking about, you know, the, the safety of the individuals we're communicating about, 
um, but as well as thinking about how we might feel like we're manipulating or triggering an audience. Um, transparency, giving trigger warnings, being as accurate with facts as we can, not sensationalizing. Um, choice, even thinking about the fact that not everyone may want to engage with our communication and everyone has lots of different reasons for that. I've been, once a coworker asked me, you know, how do you make sense of people who just don't get it, who, who, won't, who won't listen to this and really take this problem seriously? Um, and I think we do have to grapple with that, but I've also considered that there are, when, when you assume trauma in your audience, there may be a lot of reasons why people don't want to engage further. And um, one generous interpretation is that there are people who have seen enough and need to work on their own situations and not engage further with the trauma that others are going through. And that's okay too. It's worth honoring and making a space for that instead of, um, expecting people, every person to engage um, and guilting people if they don't um, or don't care enough. Um, so I'm gonna keep these principles as sort of a header on the screen as I move through the next points. Um, and the next things are just sort of 10 tips that I've collected together. So I'll try to move through those. Um, so the first one is that, especially when we're talking about sex trafficking or sexual trauma or victimization, we don't want to make the victimization sexy. Um, I think we have a culture that moves quickly back and forth between sex and violence um, and violent crime should not be sexually provocative. Um, if anything you make could, you know, held at arm's length, be confused for thumbnails on a porn site, definitely pause and rethink it. Um, even if it wasn't your intention, it's worth seeing things through the lens of like, is this inadvertently um, doing that? Um, and being sure that um, like sex appeal or someone being cute isn't part of how we elicit sympathy for a victim um, is something to keep in mind. Um, these two examples on the bottom are both um, clips from posters that are um, raising awareness about the issue of um, sex trafficking. Um, and the next point would be avoiding sensationalism and using content warnings. Um, treating the person with respect is a vital reason we choose not to sensationalize. Um, chains, blindfolds, tape over the mouth. There are arguments that these things could be read metaphorically, but I think that when it comes to this issue, that's not entirely realistic. People will understandably take these things literally. Um, and so unless it's clearly relevant, and literally relevant to a story you've chosen to tell. We try to avoid images of um, infants, uh, taped mouths, blood splatters, cages, suitcases with people inside, even those things. People will think, oh, this is a great way to metaphorically represent the issue, but people will take it literally. Um, uh, and so these are certain items that, I'm not saying those never show up in any of the cases that we've worked with, but those are extreme. Um, and they could interfere um, as well with the public and victims self-identifying. Um, when we choose to pull the most extreme scenarios or details out, um, it can, or we exaggerate those things, it can devalidate the true and typical experiences um, that victims and survivors have and, and could also alienate the public from being able to sympathize with cases when they come up. Um, so you don't want people to think, you know, well, she wasn't locked in a basement. I saw her, you know, this person went to the grocery store. They're not really trafficked. Um, we don't want people on a jury to have a reason to dismiss somebody because their only conception of trafficking looks like the movie Taken. Um, and so the more we can do um, most, yeah, to avoid sensationalizing, the better. Um, I have a coworker that's also described um, different stories of trafficking as sort of, um, entering through the deep end or the shallow end. Um, and so this, she, the way she described it as um, some, the reality of some victims um, falling, at, falling into the deep end. Um, it looks like the white van, the kidnappings, the more extreme, um, or, you know, uh, going from, yeah, zero to 60. Um, but not uncommonly either, um, there is sort of a step-by-step -step grooming um, where it's sort of, in almost a blurry way becomes exploitation and trafficking. And so um, the more we can start to find those lines and highlight those um, in a less um, exaggerated way, um, the more I think we can make space for 
the public and victims to understand what victimization really looks like. And it doesn't require all the extremities. Um, so another thought, be aware of stereotypes um, and be aware of them. Um, so common stereotypes around trafficking include what perpetrators and victims um, look like, what trafficking intervention looks like. Um, and so we wanna consider generalizations that are inaccurate and not use them, um, but also be aware that some do have a large degree of truth. And so we have to parse those things out and um, it's, it becomes a little bit, um, it sometimes gets stuck in my head the more I become aware of stereotypes and then this question of how do I avoid them or um, use them with awareness. Um, and I think that that awkwardness is sometimes not avoidable. Um, but it's still better to be thoughtful and aware um, and be handling it carefully. And so I think a lot of trafficking um, marketing material um, contains images of blonde girls. Um, and so when we look at a common image like that, that we would see, um, it's worth asking like, what are the stereotypes here and what's, what's accurate and what's not? And so, I mean, it is accurate that um, sex trafficking affects women disproportionately. Um, we might want to do a campaign some, at some point where we help people understand that boys are trafficked for sex too. Um, but that's not inaccurate. Um, however, we do know that trafficking disproportionately affects people of color. And so to continue representing at a disproportionate rate, white and blonde victims, we have to wonder why are we doing that? And how could we help the public better understand what they should be looking for and not discount, um, yeah certain victims. Um, and so the same with traffickers, we might, or perpetrators, we might think traffickers or buyers are men, um, but we know that traffickers can look like many things. We have parents that are trafficking, peers that are trafficking, community leaders that are trafficking. Um, and so I think representing a buyer with a male is not inaccurate. And that's something to, to do just consciously. Um, but one thing I wanna think about too is how could stereotypes be used, not just so that you avoid causing offense or doing it, it without taste or inaccurately, but also how can you use them really effectively? Um, and so one thing I wanted to mention is that there's certain campaigns that I've considered or pieces of material that I call, I'll call, I call front door material, meaning you're reaching the broader public um, and you're inviting them to engage further. Um, and so, when you hear people rattle off that people have, you know, an attention span of eight seconds and we have to get their attention that quickly and communicate fully in that short amount of time. Those are the scenarios where often you see some of the most exaggerated content um, because that's how we think we can get their attention. Um, and so one thing to keep in mind in those uh, venues is that you really, you have to be able to work with people's existing assumptions um, carefully and they have to be able to recognize it as trafficking. Um, so when I say an apple, you think one thing, that's like psychological schemas. We put these things together and we learn what the difference between a cat and a dog is when we're young, because somebody explains to us, we're like, oh, okay, cats look like this. And you start to learn what's what. Um, but at this point, we have to work with the assumptions that people do have um, carefully. And what one thing I wanted to mention here is just challenging one knowledge deficit at a time in those front door spaces. When we're doing a training like this, um, when you have volunteers, staff that you're onboarding, like you need to blow up all the assumptions and set folks straight. But when it's in those places that I'm calling front door where you're like, you know, hey, let me get your attention with this. Let me make you aware of this problem you may not have known, or maybe you know a little bit, but you haven't engaged further. You need to think about what knowledge deficit you want to highlight. So it might be that this is happening in your neighborhood. You might have realized that trafficking was a thing, but you didn't realize it was happening in your neighborhood. And that might be all we can do with that one particular piece of communication. I may not be able to, in the same, the same spot, make you realize that boys are victims of sexual exploitation too. That's too much for eight seconds um, for everyone's working assumptions where we're going to draw conclusions about what we're even seeing quickly enough. Um, and not have our minds blown, be able to engage. Um, especially with issues like this, people can shut down and take any opportunity to disengage. So the more you can work with the assumptions people have that are less problematic and challenge them on one assumption at a time, that can be helpful. Um, but it's good to mix those things up and think about what, what do we really want people to understand from this piece um, and be specific. Is it 
like I mentioned, that boys are exploited or that traffickers don't just look like one thing. Um, so think about what knowledge deficit you want to target. Um, handle stats and facts carefully. That's very common that we feel the need to, when we're putting together a brochure, a flyer, a thing, we've got to get some bullet points on there with the facts or the statistics. Um, and so consider that you can use facts that are not numeric statistics. Trafficking is very difficult to measure, um, understandably. And sometimes a list of facts that are not all centered on numbers can be just as compelling and actually even more um, illuminating, especially in highlighting some of the, or, you know, if you've got some, if you've got a group of people and they'll read that, um, you can challenge some of those assumptions um, and set them up to better understand your next pieces of communication. Um, if you do use stats that have um, numbers, look at them critically, question the details of them, um, and try to familiarize yourself with it so that you can um, avoid the game of telephone um, where they just change a little bit each time. Um, and so, you know, 100,000 at risk becomes 100,000 traffic, like really quickly, far too quickly. Um, Love 146, um, I wrote a blog about how we had done a piece of math. I can't even describe the way it worked, worked out, but, um, yeah, we've really butchered some statistics um, in our time as an organization. And so I can even take ownership of that um, from my own experience. And we've worked hard to try to remedy those things. Um, and so think about how old the, old the statistic is, try to go with things that are more recent if you can. Um, and just as the big facts and figures stay updated, try to familiarize yourself with what goes into them. Um, the ILO and Walk Free Foundation is some of those those big global estimates that we look to. And they recently just changed their definitions and included forced marriage in their total count of what they're calling slavery. Um, and so we have to decide when we're communicating about the issue, do we call that trafficking? Um, and, or do, we want, or do we want to just put the fact there and put in parentheses, this includes um, forced marriage. Um, so the more familiar with you are, the more familiar with the particular statistics that you like to turn to you are, the more you can just think carefully about how you wanna present them and use them. Um, on this slide, you'll see there's a link. And anytime you see that, if I, uh, when I pass over the slides, those are all hyperlinked. So Love146 put together 10 facts and stats and you all are welcome to reuse them. Um, many of them are not ours, but we cite the sources. It's always good to cite your sources. Um, be clear, um, just as specific as you can be while still being respectful and avoid victim blaming language. Um, so this is a variety of examples. Um, we often hear people refer to victims as voiceless or invisible. Um, it's metaphoric, but we've gotten feedback that it's not helpful. Um, and so it's better to put the um, responsibility off the victim and onto the wider public. So not heard or listened to, not seen or ignored. Um, child pornography or child prostitute are both terms that are seen as sort of validating something that we think is completely and, you know, not appropriate. Um, and so terms like sexual, child sexual abuse material or CSAM have arisen. Um, and there is no such thing as a child prostitute. Children can't consent to prostitution. Um, and so being clear that this is a victim. Um, the same with um, ways of describing is in, if you're writing a story, the ways you describe um, what's happened to somebody um, to say, you know, their relationship began. Is it a relationship or was it this person began grooming this person and then exploited them? So be as specific as you can be. Um, I understand that sometimes um, if you're writing a story that might include um, liabilities for making accusations or characterizing things in a certain way, that's something you have to grapple with. Um, you can't always say rape by if somebody hasn't been convicted of rape. Um, but if they have been, or if you're not, if you're telling a story in ways that are not identified, this is one benefit to de-identified storytelling is that you can be clear with what we understood happened. Um, another thing, I just put the word coerced on there to remind myself that um, trafficking is you know, by means of force, fraud, or coercion. And I think a lot of times we use the word force or we imply or lean towards situations that are just, they're easy for people to digest because they involve um, various aspects of physical force. Um, but the more you can um, highlight coercion when that's the, the means, 
I think it helps people um, to validate and see trafficking um, for the ways, various ways that it does happen. Um, this one is a new thought um, from us as an organization. In the next couple months, we're gonna put out a blog um, or a statement explaining this further, um, but we've decided to reconsider the term slavery and abolition. Um, and I put some links here for you all to explore some of that yourself and you can look for our statement when it comes out. Um, but there's several reasons. Um, and a lot of this is prompted by um, listening and feedback to black colleagues and audiences. Um, but in short, um, some of the more compelling reasons that struck me were that it's co-opting co-opting the term slavery moves the conversation away from the transatlantic slave trade and its residual impacts in our community and redirects it towards the crime of human trafficking. Um, so there are still a lot of impacts of um, slavery in our communities in America, especially. Um, and when we take the word slavery and try to make it synonymous with trafficking, it sort of shuts down some of those conversations um, that are still important for us to still have. To have. Um, and at this point, helpfully, in terms of moving on, um, human trafficking is widely understood. When the conversation was first happening 20 years ago or 30 years ago, um, people didn't as quickly recognize what human trafficking meant. Um, but at this point, folks mostly do. Um, we have a lot to do in terms of people's assumptions, but um, yeah. Um, another thought is to watch out for labels. Um, and remember that victimization can be an experience instead of an identity. Um, I wanted to highlight, this is especially true, um, that person first language when talking about individuals. And so if you have a story where you say, you know, joy was trafficked, um, it becomes a, um, an event as opposed to joy is a victim of trafficking um, or an identity or like joy, a victim of trafficking. Um, those labels can some, yeah generally best practice is to keep this event or person first kind of language. Um, I say that especially important when talking about individuals because I do think that in the, rea the reality is that when talking about groups of people, it's helpful to describe those groups. Um, still um, best to defer to how people self-describe, especially if you're using quotes or letting folks tell their own stories. Don't feel the need to redact or fix those things. People can describe how they want to. Um, and I put this note in here, it's some, a conversation that we've had a little bit internally in the past few years. Um, our co-founder was sharing with me um, that he had felt convicted that he should probably stop using terms like monster to refer to perpetrators um, or animal, you know, things that were dehumanizing um, or just othering. And it seems like, well, what do we owe perpetrators? Why would we bother? Who cares? Um, but I think that something we do it, these things, using those euphemisms, um, I mean, apart from our general sort of good integrity that we would never want to dehumanize anybody, um, I think one harm that it does is it allows people to just dis, um, discount themselves as people who could be perpetrators or cause harm. So I think the more we other um, perpetrators, the more we prevent people from grappling with the fact that they might have been a buyer at some point, or they might be contributing to this problem in many ways. Um, even words, I think something that I it's complex to talk about, um, certainly not in the front door spaces, but even in trainings and stuff, is that the word pedophile is a very particular um, clinical term. And I think predator is appropriate, but I think even that is a kind of othering term if it's not accurately referring to uh, prepubescent children. So buying a, buying a teen is not technically pedophilia. It's a predator, it is a crime, it is atrocious. Um, but I think when we don't speak accurately about perpetrators, it, the harm is that it gives people a reason to discredit. So I'll, people know that people know that they're not a pedophile. So then they would think to themselves, okay, well, I couldn't have been, I couldn't have done this because I'm not a monster. I'm not a pedophile. I don't do things like this. Um, and I think there are people that can contribute to this and be buyers, um, or contribute this in other ways and not fit under those labels. Um, respect the safe safety and privacy of survivors. Um, I think as we're telling stories, I put a link in the corner to HIPAA's guidelines for de-identified information. Those are, if you're HIPAA compliant, then you know them well probably, but um, they're, even if you're not, there's still a really helpful set of 18 different, you know, um, identifiable pieces of information. Um, 
And if you're telling stories in communication where you're not identifying a survivor, it's helpful to know how to de-identify a story and still be able to tell it. Um, and so something that we do sometimes too is you want to be able to get the essence of a story, but you can change change those details. So you don't have to simply omit each thing that would be identifiable piece of information, um, like their age or personal interests um, or even gender. Um, but you can change several of those things. And so choose which ones you change in small ways um, to the extent that you then have a story that is not identifiable um, as the survivor. Um, yeah, oftentimes, um, especially as we're working with um, victims of child trafficking, but I think this can be broader um, I think it's hard for um, folks to think about the long-term implications of going public. Um, and so, um, yeah, is this a story that you could lose control of um, for your future employers, for your children, your grandchildren? Um, all of those long-term implications are sometimes not considered when somebody's urging somebody to like go and share their story. Um, and so as much as we all, um, as, yeah, people who live in 2020 know this, uh, that the internet is forever and you can't take things back and that kind of stuff. That's, it is definitely true to some extent, but those of us that are communicators or publishing things, um, we actually have the power to change some of that to some extent. Um, there's always those logs of the internet and things like that. But I think it is worth knowing that if we have the ability to um, revise or revoke things, if somebody comes and asks for something to be taken down, um, that would be a great thing to do. Um, it's great if you're telling the story of somebody um, to give them more input that you might traditionally allow when crafting a story, um, especially if you're press. Um, people don't often get review privileges of things that are published, but if it's the story of someone's victimization and they're going public, um, I think that would be a really important thing to do. Um, at Love 146, we've decided not to be a platform for um, youth that we've provide services to going public um, because consent can, can be compromised when services are provided. Um, and so when we get, we get a lot of inquiries um, more than we could ever, um, yeah, honor to have survivors from our care come and speak to the press. Um, and so, yeah, we are often asking prosecutors or the press, how can you make your case without having to call up a survivor to testify? Um, and it, if you need to tell the story um, broadly, it's great to look at survivors that are already public um, and um, speak to service providers and law enforcement and others who can help eliminate the issue. Um, talk to a social worker instead. Um, yeah. And the last point I'm gonna make is to rethink the power dynamics. I think that when I look at some of the core of trafficking, um, it's about taking a power differential and sort of exploiting that for gain. Um, traffickers saw the individuals as people with little power and, um, and they could exploit that. Um, and so um, one of the worst things I think we could do in our communications is hold the victim in that sort of powerless role in the story or in our, um, how we present things. Um, and sort of just pick up right where the trafficker left off. Um, so in terms of empowerment, um, simple things like camera angles can matter um, in the photographs that you take or that you even choose. Um, they still rep anything that's, I think I just wanna mention for stock photography or models, things like that, that represent the issue. I think it is still representing real people. So I think that it would be, yeah, important not to portray them and these, um, high camera angles sort of pleading or helplessness. Um, the more we can do things at eye level or below is subtle but helps. Um, yeah, rethink your imagery if it hits sort of damsel and distress notes, um, try to adjust. Um, this is one of the reasons why we've stopped using words like rescue as often and opt for simpler terms like helped um, that don't kind of like need that power differential. Um, really any language that exaggerates that um, power disparity is probably not the best. Things like, I am, you're her only hope, um, or um, yeah, saved, things like that. Um, 
One other reason to re reconsider the power dynamic is that it also makes the audience a bit one dimensional as well. Um, I've seen pieces of communication that kind of imply or say, you know, you could never imagine what this person's been through. And I don't know what you can imagine. Um, I need to assume again that our audience um, has experienced trauma. Um, and so, and at the very least that everyone in the audience um, could use um, some encouragement and has bad days, everyone's human. Um, so I do our best in our communications to put the children in our programs um, in a role where their strengths and resiliency is highlighted. Um, and that can be an inspiration to others. Um, when I think back on that itch, um, I think it's just a tool. It's not necessarily the worst mechanism in marketing. Um, but I think one of the best itches we could give people is hope um, and vision um, for a world that's better. Um, so the more we can encourage folks um, that their world can be better, um, that if a child who's gone through this um, can recover um, and can give wisdom and give light to them, um, yeah, that's what we'd like to highlight. Um, and so I just wanna close by saying, if there can be vicarious trauma, trauma that we can experience in communications um, or connecting with um, people who've been victimized in our own life, I think there can also be vicarious healing. And I believe that when I communicate about the issue and folks come back and share their own stories, um, that's part of why people are engaging with this issue um, is to work out their own stories. Um, and so I think being mindful of that as a communicator in your audience. There are going to be people that are working out their own vicarious healing. And the more we can do to help that, I think the closer we ultimately are to the world we wanna be in. And now I'm good for questions. As a reminder, please feel free to type any questions you may have into the chat box. That would be one way we can ask Marilyn uh, any questions she has. Um, you can also raise your hand in the participants uh, box. There is a blue hand. If you raise that, then we can um, unmute you. Um, Marilyn, um, just as a point of clarification and to go back to it, because it is a um, for some of us in BCAT, a, a recent shift in language because we've seen it so often, but can you talk a little bit more about stopping using the word slavery when talking about human trafficking? There we go. Um, I think the most salient points of the statement that we've created, I put up here, um, I think these, there's two organizations, um, the National Survivor Network and another group called Dressember that both have statements to this end. Um, and, we, and everyone won't necessarily agree on this. Um, my screen sharing is paused, oh, here we go. Um, but I still think we don't necessarily need the term. Um, and we've gotten feedback, um, especially from black folks that it is alienating um, that slavery means a particular thing, um, especially in the American experience. Um, and so I've, I've been convicted even myself just thinking about how um, the 13th Amendment is legal slavery. Um, but those of us that consider ourselves modern day abolitionists with a capital A sort of grabbing the same mantle as the 1800s movement, um, aren't usually specifically addressing that um, in our work. Um, we're really focused on specifically child trafficking. And like I mentioned in an earlier slide, disproportionately picturing white children as being impacted by it. And so it becomes really uncomfortable and ironic um, when you start to look at those trends. Um, and at this point, um, for me, it became about listening um, and respecting that this was preventing part of our audience from engaging. And so we want the widest set of stakeholders possible um, to come to the table to end child trafficking and in trafficking. Um, and we definitely want, if people of color are disproportionately being victimized, we definitely want people of color at the table. And so to use language that we were finding out was um, alienating um, for black colleagues um, was important to listen to. 
but I don't think everyone has to agree. Um, it's still just worth considering um, reposturing because I do think that tra human trafficking is very widely understood. Marilyn, I was really struck by your reference to, um, to the movie Taken. Um, ironically, the, the volunteer that brought uh, the BCAP project to us was a, a, gold, uh, a Girl Scout who was doing her Gold Star project and she had just seen the movie Taken and wanted to get involved and, and, you know, and work on this issue. Um, mm -hmm. But it really, it makes me realize how, um, how much opportunity and responsibility we have in our community awareness and education. You talked about a juror thinking that human trafficking is just like in the movie and how much opportunity we have, uh, you know, as a coalition to make sure that people are informed because just about everybody out there is in the jury pool. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that, you know, how much impact that can have, um, you know, certainly we know that for our prosecutors, um, you know, lots of cases are uphill battles. And so it's, you know, it's really important that, um, that we're providing that kind of awareness and education to people um, before they get into the, into the jury box, for sure. And I definitely don't want to um, minimize the impact of a movie like that, bringing so many people to the table. And I think that it represents um, a particular kind of trafficking that does exist. It's not necessarily the majority, um, but if it brought you through the front door um, to then engage further, I think that's great. Um, I just think it's also worth, as we are content creators, thinking about how we can keep adding balance so that we're um, doing the most help that we can. I think it's also worth thinking about why did that movie get so much traction? What about that particular scenario and all the details of it? Um, worked so well with an audience and what kind of biases um, or preferences do we have that allowed for that? Um, I think there are other diverse representations happening, probably not enough, but I think there are, um, and maybe not with the same level of A-list actors and those types of things. Um, but there definitely are other representations and other box office type movies, um, but not many with the level of impact of Taken. So I think that's even revealing in and of itself um, about just us as a group of people in a culture. Uh, Marilyn, I have a question um, that I'll represent for an audience member um, who says that they understand your position on um, language power dynamics and um, the importance ling linguistics play. Um, but it is often challenging to use um, soft words in our line of work also um, and still capture the attention that's necessary. Um, such as the word help, you know, many organizations help other people and there's a wide range of what that definition means. Um, mm -hmm. And they may dilute the importance of a specific issue or the passion behind that mission or the need to gain critical awareness and importance of the issue. Um, do you have any suggestions on critically thinking about the balance between um, not using of, uh, of keeping the message trauma informed without using too soft of a language? Um, it's really difficult. Um, I think it's ultimately worth it, um, but it is something I definitely grapple with. I think that my best advice is um, something that I've, a challenge that's been put to me in the past year is thinking about sort of where's the line and when are we crossing the line? Um, and so, we might discern those in different places, but ultimately something that I've um, been guilty of is sort of running from the line. Um, and so in a mindset sort of sense, I need to think more about how to walk right up to the line without crossing it. Um, and so the more I can familiarize myself with and be listening to feedback and adjusting my sense of where is the line and what does it look like to cross it, um, which I hope my presentation helps calibrate um, for you all to do your own work on that. Um, but the more you can familiarize yourself with where the line is, then the challenge is how do you come closer to it um, instead of running the other direction just because you're afraid of it. Um, and I think the reality, I don't want to make mistakes, but I think that we do. Um, 
and it's part of the tension we yeah we have and I think I struggle with the reality of some of the mistakes I made have brought people through the front door um and they might have they might have helped in that sense but they might have also harmed in other ways and so how can I keep moving forward more responsibly I still think when you know better do better um and so how it's it doesn't necessarily resolve that tension and I don't think we can necessarily put that to rest but it's a good tension to have um and I think that mindset of walking up to the line is probably the best help I've had for it in the past year and not trying to do too much at once I think that that challenging one knowledge deficit at a time there's times where I want to pack all of the nuance into one thing um, and sometimes you can't do all of that Thank you, Marilyn. And I'm not sure if you're watching the chat. So in case you weren't, I just want to let you know that Rachel said this was really eye opening. Thank you. Um, and then I have two reference questions that have come up. Um, and you can take them in whichever order you want. One is, uh, before we would go tonight, could you talk a little bit about uh, one love 146's uh, resources and ways to connect to the organization, social media, um, somebody comp commented that um, you all as an organization have really great um, readings, articles, videos, um, things that we as participants may be able to reference to continue our education and learning moving forward. Um, I'll pause, I'll pause there. <laughs> sure. I mean, so we're on all the big social media spots um, where you would go looking. Um, we're on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. We have an email list. Uh, we have a website. We have YouTube and Vimeo and videos and um, and I hope that what you find there is in line with all the things that we have here. I will say I continue to keep growing. And so um, I was just talking a couple days ago with a colleague about, I'd like to do a full review of all of our videos and can you go back through and recheck them for certain issues? Um, and can we consider taking down ones that are, are problematic or can if we don't wanna take it down, can we add a pop-up that annotates a blog that says we've rethought this and here's something you could do to learn more. Um, just thinking about how we can keep our communications in line with what we're learning. So I'll tell you, as you go to those places, keep in mind that um, another tension that we struggle with is trying to keep everything as up to date as we can. Um, it's one other reason in statistics to put dates on your stats um, as of fill in the blank year, instead of saying right now. Um, yeah, those are all the spots you can connect. And then the follow up or part two of that resource um, question is um, if there was somebody or an organization who's developing an article or a PSA and they wanted to post that, or, but were concerned about the issues, um, would you or somebody else from your organization be willing to take a look at it and help to make sure um, that they aren't perpetrating inadvertent harm and that it's with a trauma-informed lens? I'm not sure that I would actually be the best person to do that in terms of capacity or even expertise. I think I'm learning about this. I certainly could casually do it, but I think that um, I've benefited. Um, I don't know how widely accessible these things are, and I so I don't want to vouch and drop names here and then have them not line up with what's possible. But some things that come to mind that I would look into, um, the um, Department of Justice Office of Victims of Crime has a training and technical assistance center that is connected to a network of survivors um, that have done training and technical assistance. Um, and so we recently were um, benefited from some consulting with them about how we tell stories. Um, there is um, networks of survivors and groups like that that I think would be great to give feedback. Um, and so if somebody wants to send me something, you're welcome to, and I'll do my best. But I also encourage you to look into, um, yeah, training and technical assistance groups or trauma-informed trainers um, that could look at things with that particular lens. And uh, an additional question is, uh, I'm curious about the choice of color, font, and imagery to convey your message in the presentation tonight and also on your website, which is different, the commonality being black text. Hmm. Um, let's see. I mean, Ken, do you want to unmute and share any more about your question? I'm happy to, I love design, I'm happy to answer more. Is it a question of legibility or meaning, things like that? Uh, I, I realize we only have two more minutes for uh, taking an hour, so it may not be. This is kind of a probably a, a bit of a um, a well to go into, but 
I just I just noticed, you know, you only have two colors in in the, in mm. the imagery that you you showed tonight, and and I wonder whether that was conscious or or what. And you know, I mean, it, it's kind of a big question towards the end of a, a, a thing. So um, I can't necessarily speak to the deeper meaning, but I am a graphic designer, and I find that things are really simple when you simplify them. Um, and so as putting together a series of illustrations, I was like, you know, you can only maintain some level of stylistic congruency um, if you take a consistent approach that you can replicate. So I was able to create lots of illustrations that felt cohesive um, by keeping it really simple. Um, and, okay. and you do that in, in general um, with presentations, just keep it very, very simple so it's not it seems almost intentional to be really simple. I'll and, say uh, to bring it back around to a, a tip that might be helpful within the presentation. One principle of design that I have found really important um, for putting together public awareness efforts and all of that is hierarchy. The thing you want, I would even say the slide I'm on is not excellently doing it, but this one's maybe better. Um, when you're creating a poster or a billboard or something, you want people to know where to look first and then where to look second and third. And mm -hmm. it's not always gonna go from left to right, like reading a page. So you need to know where do their eyes go first? Maybe they need to connect eyes with the person, the stock photo or the model or the real person that's pictured um, and then the headline and then the sub headline. But, and you wanna be sure that things are legible and that you don't haven't put more than someone can engage with. Um, but thinking about hierarchy is important and I think an off common mistake, if I'm hiring a designer or thinking about somebody to contribute to our work, a common mistake is people having too many items that are competing for attention on one, one piece. Um, so as you're thinking about putting your things together, just think about you know what's number one, two, three, and four. Um, and like I said, they don't have to go top to bottom. You can, pull, you can put a big pull quote in the middle of a block of text if you want someone to go there first, because they may not get to the you know, second or third. Um, so. That's my, in terms of simplicity, that's one thing to keep in mind. Great, super. Um, so listen, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna send on the other questions um, in the chat to Marilyn and she can respond um, and we'll get those answers out to you. Um, I wanna thank you, Marilyn, for taking the time to create this wonderful presentation and share your expertise. Um, lots for us to think about and consider and, um, and bring into our work as we move forward. So I, I really appreciate that. 